God is. Or to say it with our text, God is who He is. Or to say it philosophically, God absolutely is. Period. And everything changes. One of the billions of facts of all the billions and billions of facts that there are this fact God is is the most basic and the most ultimate all other facts rest here all other facts go there there is nothing underneath the fact God is holding it up nothing above the fact God is to which all is tending this is the most basic most ultimate fact that is God is We are blown away by the truth that God is. And if you aren't, you're asleep. It is a staggering thought and reality. God absolutely is. This is explosively uncontainable. This is wildly untamable. This is electrically future creating. And so what I want to do now is to tell you 10 things that it means. God's absolute being means he never had a beginning. Number two, God's absolute being means God will never end. He won't go out of being. If he did not come into being, he cannot go out of being because he is being. God's absolute being means God is absolute reality. There is no reality before God. There is no reality outside of God unless God wills it and makes it. He is not one of many realities before He creates. He is simply there, and He is absolutely there. He is all that was, eternally. There was no space. There was no universe. There was no emptiness. There was only God, and that's all that it was eternally. Number four, God's absolute being means that God is utterly independent. He depends on nothing to bring him into being 
or to support him or to counsel him or to make him what he is, that is what the word absolute being that I'm using means. Number five, God's absolute being means rather that everything that is not God depends totally on God. All that is not God is secondary, dependent. The entire universe, let it be said clearly and matter of fact, the entire universe is secondary. And God alone is primary. The universe came into being by God, stays in being moment by moment on God's decision to keep it in being. It is utterly, totally fragile and dependent and secondary. God holds it in existence every millisecond of its If he changed his mind, it would be nothing. Six, God's absolute being means all the universe is, by comparison to God, as nothing. Number seven, God's absolute being means that God is constant. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He cannot be improved. He is not becoming anything. He is who He is. There is no development in God. There is no progress in God. Absolute perfection cannot be improved. Number eight, God's absolute being means that He is the absolute standard of truth and goodness and beauty. There's no law book to which he looks in determining what is right and just. There is no almanac to establish the facts for God. There is no guild to determine what is excellent or beautiful in art, music, creation. He himself is the standard of what is right, what is true, and what is beautiful. Number nine. God's absolute being means God does whatever He pleases. And it is always right and it is always beautiful. There are no constraints on Him from outside that could hinder Him from doing what He pleases. All reality that is outside him, he created, he designed, he governs, 
as the absolute reality. So he is utterly free from any constraints that don't originate in the counsel of his own will and therefore being absolutely free he always does his good pleasure and it is always right and beautiful and number 10 God's absolute being means that he is the most important and the most valuable reality and the most important and the most valuable person that is. He is worthy of your highest interest your greatest attention, your deepest admiration, and your sweetest enjoyments. Including being superior in all those ways to the whole universe. That is what we believe. God is. It is a wildly untamable, explosively uncontainable, and electrically future-creating reality. God is. Tick, tock, tick. We've all heard the sound of a clock. Have you ever stopped to think about what it means? Do you know how many minutes there are in a day? 1,440. Do you know how many hours there are in a week? 168. It's interesting to me that rich people cannot buy more hours. Scientists cannot invent new minutes. You cannot even save time to spend it on another day. You've got a little time today. You say, well, I'd like to save it up for tomorrow. You can't do that. Do you number your days? Do you realize how important every single day is? Millions are crying, what can I do to be saved from the pressures of life? The pressures are just so great. We have great technology to save time, but we have less time than ever. The tensions in the home, problems at work, health problems, making ends meet. We want to scream at life. We want to escape from life. Adlai Stevenson once said, it's not the days of your life but the life in your days that count. You have so much time, but for what? The things that are broken in your heart and life can be restored in Christ if you put your faith and your confidence in Him. He died on the cross. He rose from the dead for you. He wants to give you guidance in your life. He wants to give you a peace and joy and assurance that if you died, you'd go to heaven. But first, there must be a change. You must turn around. That's called repentance in the Bible. Repent. Repent. Time is collapsing on us. How much longer do we have? The psalmist requested that the Lord remember how short my time is. 
My days are like a shadow that declineth, and I'm withered like grass. But thou, O Lord, shalt endure forever, and thy remembrance unto all generations. Think of it. God will endure forever. But on this earth, we're like a shadow that's declining. We're all dying. From the moment you were born, you started dying. How much longer do we have? God looks at your heart and God sees that you have a spiritual heart disease and that spiritual heart disease is called sin. And we're all sinners. That means we've broken the laws of God. We've disobeyed God. We've rebelled against God. And because we've rebelled against Him, we're going to have to face a judgment. Oh yes, there's coming a judgment. There'll be some day when you will stand before God at the great judgment day and you'll have to give an account of your life here and you'll have to give an account of what you did with Jesus Christ on this very night because there's going to be a judgment. But God's judgment is also tempered by His love and His mercy. He's willing to forgive you tonight. He's willing to give you a chance tonight. No matter how much time you've wasted in the past, you can still have tomorrow. Some of you think that you're too bad to come to God, have done too many things and gone too far. God's not waiting to judge you. God's not waiting to condemn you. God loves you. He sent His Son to die on the cross for you, to shed His blood for you. He wants to put His arms around you and receive you, and He will take you and forgive you and love you and be your friend. In Romans, the sixth chapter says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. In 1 Peter, it says, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness. He became sin, think of it. Jesus Christ, this pure, this wonderful, the greatest person that ever lived, the holiest person that ever lived, the Son of the living God, became sin. He had never known sin, and he became guilty at that moment of adultery. He became guilty of lying, of idolatry. He became guilty of every ugly, dirty thing you can think of because it was your sins poured out on him. Through Christ, we can have the most fundamental relationship in life restored. You say, well, Billy, what in the world do I have to do? First, you must repent of your sins. The apostle Peter said, repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins be blotted out. What does repentance mean? Repentance means that you come to God and say, God, I'm sorry I've sinned. And we're all guilty. Every one of us, everyone that's ever been born is guilty. Have you repented? Are you sure of it? It means that you not only say, God, I'm sorry. It means that you ask him to help you to turn from your sins, to change your way of living, to get rid of those old habits you shouldn't have. And then you must come by faith. By, without faith, it's impossible to please him. The word faith means that you totally trust. The scripture says in Romans 4, to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. I have to have righteousness to get into heaven, and I don't have any. Billy Graham is a sinner. I don't have any righteousness of my own. I come in the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then the Bible says, for by grace are ye saved through faith, not of works, lest anyone should boast. If you can work your way to heaven, you'd get up to heaven and boast to everybody. Look what I did. I was such a good person, I got here on my own. You get there totally because of Christ. The fact that time is short calls for us to do something about it now because the scripture says in 2 Corinthians 6, 2, now is the accepted time, not tomorrow, today. Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart. You can harden your heart. You hear a message like this and it can be very dangerous because you'll harden your heart. And the next time you hear the gospel, your heart will be harder and harder and harder. 
come to Christ now. If there's even a whisper in your heart that you need to come, you come and say, Lord, you have all of me tonight. I want to be sure that I'm ready to meet you. Come now. Come now. If you'd like to receive Christ, then you can pray a prayer like I did. Or like I did. Like I did. Dear God, I'm a sinner. I'm sorry for my sins. And I want to turn from my sins. I believe Jesus Christ is your son. I believe he died for my sin and that you raised him to life. I want to trust him as my savior and follow him as Lord. From this day forward, Jesus, I put my trust in you. And I surrender my life to you. And I surrender my life to you. I surrender my life to you. Please come into my life and fill me with your Holy Spirit. And I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.